This works? Yeah. Um, is it too small? Oh, well, yeah, but that's just the headers. I mean, it's... Uh, okay. Um, so uh, we wanted to um, introduce this topic about compiled BPF, which is what... Uh, uh, just by chance, uh, a big part of Alexei's intervention was actually about that too, right? All those problems that they are having, you know, with, uh, with Clang, in this case, you know, compiling all that stuff. And, um, well, the first thing I, will, I wanted to say is that compiling uh, BPF to BPF from high-level languages, from C in this case, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy. And um, part of the reasons well, I, I hope that the little disc discussion points that we have for today are going to exemplify that. And uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's difficult. It's a difficult thing to do. But I think that innovation, it requires a strong foundations. Because you may be uh, having all fun, you know, like innovating all around. But if you don't have a strong foundations, um, everything is going to collapse sooner or later. And when it comes to not just the instruction set, but all those things like you mentioned it, BPFC, right? I think it's the first time I see that written down somewhere, but probably it will not be the last. But, yeah. Anyway, so we wanted to go through some of uh, some very particular topics. I'm sorry it's going to be a little bit boring, but uh, those are things that we will really need to clarify because we are sort of a stack, uh, you know, in the work in the GNU toolchain support, in GCC and Binutils, in those different topics, so we need to, to discuss about them. So let's start. So the first one is um, one problem, one situation that we have with the core built-ins, with a lot of them. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, well, it happens that all the core built-ins but one, they take uh, arbitrary expressions and the first argument. Like this is, you know, like preserving and value, preserve type info, field info, and so on. And uh, this works, in particular with Clang, because uh, Clang, when it uh, handles those buildings, and this is internal, internal in the compiler, um, it needs to be enabled to extract the type of the expression that you are passing from the IR that it's getting, you know, internally, it's handling the compiler. In the case of GCC, this will be the tree representation. In LLVM, I guess, it's some sort of IR, which is tree-like, I guess, too. Um, in any case, in any case, um, uh, you cannot use those built-ins directly, because if you use the built-in directly, and, for example, you say, uh, built-in preserving and value, and then you pass, you know, some in value, it's not going to work. You have to be sure to pass a very particular C expression that results in a true internal representation that the Clank implementation happens to know how to deal with. And that's why in BPF core read.h, you have macros like this one that they make sure to pass expressions which are carefully crafted so they work with this particular version of Clang, and it's not guaranteed that it's going to work forever. As Alexei mentioned, for example, new, new optimization in the parser. Clang is going to do constant folding in the parser like GCC does. That's one of the problems we had. This stops working. So um, we identified three different magic expressions that uh, um, uh, are used by this kernel header to make sure that that built-in is invoked with something that the compiler can actually understand, which are those three. So we have two problems in GCC. First is that indeed GCC does constant folding at parsing time. And uh, it happens that none of those magic expressions work for us. Because at the time that the backend can, uh, is able to, you know, to handle the built-in, the type information associated with the enumerated value is lost. Um, that's one of the problems, which is particular to us. And the second is that um, 
this is fragile. This can break any time. This can break any time. Clank, oh, we are going to do it like GCC does. Everything stops working, which is not very good for using friendliness and so on, right? So, um, so those are the two different problems we wanted to, to discuss a little bit with you. Um, the first one is, um, well, we are actually working now in GCC, so we can inhibit the constant folding in the parser. And that's another interesting thing that links with what you were saying before. I think we are the only backend in GCC that now we are going to have to reach up to the parser, right? Which is very uncommon, right? But we will have to. Because again, yeah, this BPFC, right, it will be in this case, maybe requires to not do some optimizations, even at the parse level, which is the top level one, right? Anyway, so the first question I have for you. We are now trying to inhibit this in GCC, but in any case, we are going to have to come with another three or maybe four magical um, expressions that we will, have to, we will need to use, and they may be different to the Clang ones. So my first question for you is, uh, will, you, will you be OK to have conditional if devs in BPF core read uh, for UCC? Uh, that's probably a question to Yun Hong. But we can change Clang, right? So we can change this type. If you think the passing type into this preserve will, yeah. will work, then why not? Right. Um, that, was, that will be the proper way of fixing this. I mean, this, I mean, this is in the meanwhile. Because we are, we really want GCC to run the the BPF self test. It's about time, you know, and uh, it's very frustrating for us because we've been working like for years on this. And but okay, yeah. What would be the proper way? It seems to us we may be wrong, but that the 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 whole difficulty here is that what you want to pass to the built-in is the type, well, also the expression. But if you if you could pass the type as an extra argument, but you cannot do that in C. Right? Because in C, you cannot pass types as arguments. You cannot have types. So how, what to do? Um, Cupertino, who, is, who, is, who works for us, uh, with us uh, in this in Oracle as well, he, he was thinking about maybe we could use BTF type identifiers to identify the type. Because you can indeed pass an, a, a number right to the built-in. What do you think about that? Uh, this is a half-cooked idea. Eh? I, I mean, I'm just throwing it. I think the VM. Yonghong again, please correct me. The ID is being set only at the very last part. So at we the have the same problem. <laughs> in the yeah. in the front end, we cannot. The ID is unknown, right? So. Yeah. Anyone have any idea of how cool this? I mean, how could we pass somehow a type to a C built-in? Doesn't C have like this generic macro where you can actually pass the type? So how does that work? So you have like generic, and then you match on type, and then you like pass different ex like use different expressions, different values depending on like what type of the variable is and stuff like this. I think it's even used in kernel. Underscore generic with capital G. I don't know about that, but but those macros are polymorphic anyway already. In the, in the, as the first argument, you don't uh, pass. Um, it doesn't expect any particular type, yeah. But OK, yeah, what like is my, this? My kind of point slash question is, like, it seems like C has some way to pass type. So we should look okay, into so like how, how generic is, this is called? implemented. Underscore, underscore, underscore generic. generic was capital G. I think that that's how it's called. And it's used in some okay. of the uh, Linux uh, headers. Um, I'm just. Uh, uh, sort of a, a BPF user, uh, not, not an internal designer. <laughs> um, but listening to this, it occurs to me that um, it sounds like the front end parser is OK. Um, you're having major troubles with the, with the IR and the optimization there. And then you're having troubles with the back end because it's unusual. And then you're having troubles with the overall design because you want to reach back from the, uh, from the back end all the way up to the parser. So, so tell me again why you want to use LLVM and not just do your own thing instead. It sounds like it's a, a bit of a, a force fit. 
Just from, that's an outsider point of view. You mean that why why compiling C to BPF instead no, of no, writing no. your own BPF? I'm not questioning what BPF needs. I'm questioning how you're doing it. You're using LLVM to get there. Right. Steal, oh. steal the parts you need from LLVM and, and move on, fork it, whatever. It doesn't sound like it fits at all. And and it doesn't sound like the community wants you to make the changes that you need. That's, again, that's my well, first snapshot. Well, I cannot talk for LLVM. I don't work with LLVM nor Clang. Actually, I avoid it as much as I can. So I am, you know, on the GCC side. But I would not like to, 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 write a, uh, to rewrite a C compiler for this. I hope it doesn't have to go that way. Well, I guess when I say right, I'm, I'm assuming you'd stand on top of prior art. So, you know, fork. <laughs> yeah, but, and also don't forget that now it's not just Clang. It's also Rust C. And also in GCC, we have a Rust front end. And that's one, one the, some other of the topics we have for today. Yeah. OK, well, thanks for, the, for this, under, this generic thing. Because if we can dispatch on types, maybe we can fix this. Yeah, but just in general. Like whatever the underlying implementation of those macroses that are exposed from BPF core read header, like we should preserve the behavior, right? So like right now, macroses like uh, allow to accept either like the type, so you do like struct, blah blah uh, blah, or like you pass the field and then we extract type from that. It so, it, like, it is fragile, but you know I understand the struggle because we have the same problem, right? I think that now in Clang, the you recognize some shapes of trees, right? Some shapes of of expressions. If it's something that it doesn't know how to handle, it errors out, which is the user frustration, right? Right. If I write this expression this way, it works. If if I don't, it doesn't work, right? Yeah. So if if we can't pass a type because there's no construct in C, why don't we pass in a string and come up with our own little format that both compilers would have to understand that says this is the type we want to look at? If you could somehow come with a mapping bit from a strings to particular C types that are being defined in the compilation unit, I guess, then yes. Yeah, that would be another way of doing it. Yeah. C++ has this type ID. Would that help? <laughs> C++. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are we are now trying to get C BPF. C++ BPF is something that is going to blow, you know, this whole place Maybe here. Maybe some similar mechanism. Using yeah. Poof. Yeah. Well, yeah, that will be, you know, like cherry picking C++ features. I don't know. Would you like that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. OK, well, I hope we will have time, like those days, to discuss about all of this, right? I don't know. It's my first time in this conference, but I hope so, because, OK, so let's move forward. I'm glad that uh, we sort of agree. So can we have those uh, conditional compilation thing in the header for the, for the time being? When, OK, thanks. Good. So. Yeah, yeah, that we will look at. Uh, yeah, thank you. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, if we can pass the sort of passing types, that would be great. So let's go to the, to the quarreling parts. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So I don't know if you have noticed, but you know, I mean, um, the, the assembler language that you people are using is very weird, right? And that um, what I wanted to do here today is that uh, I mean I don't want trouble. If 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 I find trouble, fine, we go to trouble. But I don't want trouble, right? And but um, these sort of things they have consequences, and in this case, it's pain, right? A lot of pain and money, right? Um, but okay, let's see. So. Right now, there are two sort of main uh, BPF uh, assembler dialects, so to say, right? Um, I think there is more, but the ones that actually are relevant somehow are those ones. There is the main one, which is, we call it pseudo-C, because it sort of look, look like C statements, right? Um, originally, BPF verifier format, I found that sentence in your first patch to, uh, to Clang, because this comes, I think, from the format that the verifier used to, to dump, right, to print 
the, the bytecode. Um, and then we have like a normal, boring, yeah, it's boring, totally lacking all sort of innovations, you know, uh, assembler-like dialect, which is the one that we support in GCC, which it was not gratuitous, I mean, because we got it, most of it from the UBPF uh, implementation, which was at the time we, I started the port to BPF in GCC, UBPF was already around, and we use more or less the same, it's the same syntax. Um, right, so in that table you see uh, in the, cl the Clang, RASC, LLVM, for both assembler and disassembler, it uses the pseudo C dialect, so it can parse it, and you, in the disassembler you get the dumps like that. Um, the compiler column here is what the compiler generates, but in case of Clang and LLVM, this will be IR, not a textual representation of the assembly language, of the assembler program, because as you know, LLVM, they got all the abstractions wrong, right? So, so this is IR. Now, in GCC Binutils, you have the, we have support in the assembler for both syntaxes, and actually you can mix them in the same source file, so you can write one line, one instruction in one format, the next one in the other one. Um, in the disassembler, we at the moment we only support the normal assembler-like dialect. And then in the compiler, I'm working on that right now, um, uh, we are working to make a GCC, if you pass an option, to generate the pseudo C syntax as well. This is necessary for inline assembly, which I did not realize until very recently because, because I'm not very smart. So, but then, yeah, I realized that the encoding of the registers in both dialects is different. So if you use inline assembly and then you have an, an input argument and it's a register, then, okay. So, and here it is. Here is, we, in our best faith, you know, and in the best, in the best uh, common interest, in our opinion, humble perspective, we recommend you to ditch the pseudo C syntax. I know you like it, right? But this is not about personal likings, trust me. So, we recommend to progressively, to progressively trans, you know, go from one to the other. Why? First, this is expensive. We literally, in my company, my team, we, we had, you know, uh, someone, you know, implementing, you know, the pseudo C syntax. Uh, when we did the Binutils port to BPF, and you know this is important because you have to convince your management, right, to do these kind of projects. And they look at the money, uh, what can I say? So, and the time is spent on things. So one of the things we did was to use Cigen, which is something that some other ports in, the, in, in, in Binutils do, to generate our opcodes and everything. Cigen also provides a parser for your assembler, la assembler language, surprise. It does not work with this sort of, uh, of, of syntax, right? So we had to write a parser on the side. That was expensive. We managed to convince our management to actually pay for this, but maybe next time we won't be able to do so, right? Um, the second point, it, having a syntax like this for assembly languages is problematic. It's problematic because there is a lot of existing infrastructure, like assemblers, supporting several targets, disassembler supporting several targets, um, things like Cigen, which is the CPU, you uh, provide a CPU description, it generates a parser for you. Um, LaTeX, right? In LaTeX you have templates. When you write your papers or your presentations for assembly language, they don't work with this neither, right? Um, editors, and I don't, this is very important, you know, I, I, I hate it when people diminish the importance of this. It is very important if someone is going to write a BPF assembler for that person to be able to use whatever mode her editor has for editing assembler programs, right? They don't work with this syntax neither. IDEs, same thing, like Eclipse, you know, all that stuff, and so on. So it's problematic. It may be nice, cool, very innovative may have some advantages, but it is, it is problematic, objectively. It's problematic, it has a cost, it comes at a cost. It's also ambiguous, um, but it, actually, I have to confess something. I was like, okay, I'm gonna look at the syntax of this when, I impl when we implemented it, and I'm sure I'm gonna find a lot of ambiguities. No, it's actually not that, uh, there is only one syntactic ambiguity, 
that actually in Clang you actually handle, which is that um, since the registers they don't use a prefix, and you have this equal signed uh, statement, there is, a, there is an ambiguity in the syntax with the symbol assignments, which are supported by both GAS and the LLVM assembler. So you cannot actually use uh, foo equals 10 as a symbol if you are compiling a BPF assembly program. Um, and then the last point is that it is pervasive, which is that because of the inline assembly, whatever syntax you use, everyone has to support it. Right? So it's not something that, oh, you know, you, in your toolchain you use that one, in my toolchain I use that other one. No. So, um, so that's the question that we wanted to bring here. Is it really worth it? That's it. I mean, again, this is not about personal liking of the whatever of the dialect. Actually, I'm not going to tell you if I like it or not because it's irrelevant. Right? Um, we really, really recommend you to go and use a normal, conventional, boring, garden variety assembler language syntax because your future will be way more, or less, pro it will be less problematic, and mine especially, right? So this is the message we wanted to bring here. Now, I know we will have time to discuss, I guess, right, during those days, but then in the meanwhile, um, there are a, a couple of, um, of uh, little things, which is, um, for some reason, I don't know why, in the BPF uh, assembly parser that you have in, in LLVM, um, the prefix uh, bitwise not is not supported because you have a switch statement there that actually filters before calling to the parse expression from the, I don't know, well, little thing. And, uh, and the second is that for some reason, even though in the code I, th I see that you allow open parentheses, in the expressions, for some reason, uh, the sub-expressions are not working. But uh, those are the only two divergences that I have found between our parser and your parser. So if we get this cleared out, then we are good. Okay. Um, so as a, as a user of, of the, like, I guess maybe um, maybe I'm back interpreting this a little bit, but the, the original reason for the Zulu assembly was to make the verify more <coughs> legible, I guess. And this was at a time when the there wasn't a way to add a debug info to BPF, I imagine. Like right now you could you can add like this is the line of C that this originated from and then now you can kind of it's easier to understand what the output is. So maybe Nowadays, we actually need the, the Zudo C dialect less because we have better debug information that gives us line info. That's number one. Number two is um, I've been bitten by this uh, by there's a website called godbolt.org where you can kind of, yeah, the compiler explorer, you can punch in your code and it compiles it to BPF. And it doesn't work properly for like it doesn't get the coloring, etc., right? Because like BPF has a weird syntax basically and I opened a ticket it's like oh could you fix the coloring for this and he's like oh yeah that's kind of unfortunate <laughs> uh, seems difficult I don't know if that's going to happen so um, kind of experience report that yeah you're right I think this this actually does really cause pain um, okay. my question is if if this if the assembly format became the like what you something like you described would the output of the verifier and the kernel have to change would we keep it as it is or what would be the, the way forward? Is it a requirement of you to be able to feed to to feed uh, the output of the verifier to an assembler? Then you could get it in like in in aquarellas, right, with colors or whatever, right, for what you care. Like, uh, is there a reason? Uh, is there some reason why those the formats should be the same? Probably ease of use, I would say, that people are used to that here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's been out in the wild for so long. I 
I think consistency matters here, right? So like I used to be a noob as well at some point, right? And like I learned the BPF assembly just by reading BPF output, BPF verifier output, right? And then I started like translating that to like writing my own inline assembly from time to time. So I think that's like a super useful property. And I don't know if like if all of those downsides actually beats the a little bit more understandable assembly. Because like I, I work with customers, right? And like even with this simpler syntax, they're already afraid of like reading BPF assembly. If we go to JGT and like then like three parameters and like you have to remember which one is which, I think it will be like a huge uh, like step back in terms of ease of use. So like it, this actually goes straight against the like goal of like simplifying the user experience, especially for new people. Okay, well I don't want to be nasty, but I don't think your customers should be writing any kind of assembler, honestly. Sure, that would be ideal. World. I mean, if Except if if, some of have if, if reading something like jump greater than register blah is going to be a problem for them, I don't think they should be writing BPF assembler at all. I mean, yeah, I understand, but. Uh, what can I say? Yeah, if, what is easier to read? The one at the top or the one at the bottom? Maybe it's the one at the top. All I'm saying here is that this has consequences. And I will hate for you to not realize the consequences before it's too late. That's, that's all. I mean, before I hand off, like what's too late, I guess, here? Well, actually, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe it's, not, it's already too late in this sense. Yeah, I mean, I, like, if you're writing a BPF program, you've probably read x86 assembly. Like, you can read, you should be able to read uh, jump no. greater. <laughs> like, I hear your point, Andre, but I mean, I don't know. It's, if, if it, like, requires you having double the the amount of support across every tool chain, I don't think it, I, I disagree that it outweighs it in terms of the readability, personally. But it's, I, I, I also think it's subjective. Um, so I just looked at uh, what UBPF does right now, and it uses the assembler-like dialect almost. It's a different dialect, which doesn't use the parentheses there. So UBPF isn't using the parentheses in the bottom one, right? So if GCC and UBPF actually slightly diverge, there's you know A and A prime or something like that, that gets to my main point. Um, uh, and I'm looking at you, David, over here. Um, the compiler expectations topic that we said should be like in the BPF standardization stuff, um, this whole discussion here probably goes into that work item or whatever to say what is actually the this and whether there's one variation or two variation. One is better, right, but the point is whatever it is, we should agree on it because we see at least three different dialects is my point, right, and says so that's a case for standardization uh, to help the ecosystem converge rather than keep diverging. We're offloading the assembler like to pseudo C like uh, translation to a separate program help. So the back end don't have to do it, but you can have a separate program that can translate for humans um, the assembly like. I and guess. then you strike kind of a you know yeah. a middle ground. But let me let me for example give you a, 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 a real example, particular example of the kind of problems this sort of syntax uh, has. Right now I am modifying GCC to generate this instead of the normal assembler. We are basically, that implies to obfuscate in a very awful way the machine descriptor description that we have. Um, and also GCC, for example, assumes that register names have pre pre prefixes, which by the way is something that assembly languages do. It's not a capricious, you know, there are reasons for that, for example, so you don't have ambiguity of symbol names with registered names, you know, stuff like that. And the thing is that this makes it very difficult to support you. That's the thing, all I'm saying. So something simple becomes a problem. Something that could be done in a couple of days using, you know, like a normal uh, syntax, it translates into, into projects of weeks or if not months. And that's, but the question is, is it worth it? That's the thing, that's all the question. I mean, is this really worth it? That's it.
So that is what I was suggesting, to progressively, because obviously this has to be supported. And actually, we are working hard of supporting this, because this exists and there is in line assembly. And even if it is changed, if, even if it was changed, it will be, you know, we need to, we, we need to support this basically forever. But uh, we, re we recommend to translate, to transition to a more conventional one. Yeah, we think that uh, we may be wrong. Eh? I mean, maybe this is the best thing, but we don't think so. Okay, but, uh, I think like we better <coughs> move forward. We can, oh well. Yeah, like one short question with the inline assembly, is it possible, I mean, that all the remaining tooling, you would only support the assembler-like dialect, but for the inline assembly, you would support both, or does it require that all the other tooling also uh, yeah. needs this? Well, it would be, it could be, and actually one of the, pro that we will need to make the compiler aware of the syntax that is written there when you use inline assembler, right? Which maybe in LLVM is easier because you have the integrated assembler, but in GCC, GCC takes those templates as uh, opaque things. But maybe, maybe, yeah. I mean, maybe that's kind of a middle ground or, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We could go maybe a step by a step, uh, for example. What if you would support uh, using prefixes in the register names optionally for now? You know, only that, for example, will make our work life much easier and other people's life easier. But yeah. As far as, so like, I'm a bit puzzled. You already did all of the work, right? Supporting it in assembly and in compiler. And you're saying, well, I did all of the work and now you don't want to maintain it, or like, why? Like, I just don't see, it. since you already pretty much completed the work of supporting this pseudo C that you don't like, what are you proposing? There is only like GCC and LLVM compilers, realistically, right? Uh, do you care about whatever, Intel compiler? Like, who will do the another BPF backend? Like, I'm just not seeing like what this other stuff, like, editors yeah like just do the like say it's not the assembler the way i like write assembler and just say this is c and it highlights everything nicely you just you don't have to say it's assembler you say it's c and syntax collagen works magically by default uh c gen yeah i totally understand it's a pain because of the way gcc is written but it zero pain for LVM because the LVM is written differently it can be a pain for the third compiler but i don't see a third compiler right so you don't think that it is things like this that is making your interaction with the clan people so difficult at the moment? Definitely not the assembly. It's not 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 the uh, syntax. I don't. I'm not mean this particular point, but I mean generally speaking. I mean, you say you have done the work already, right? Well, it's not been easy. Sure. So why not making it easy? What do you gain by being difficult for no reason? What? That's what I don't get, honestly. I mean, this is just one aspect of the whole thing. But why? I mean, why? If all the assembly well, languages, they have a uh, structure. I have, I have another question for you. Why GCC uh, still doesn't have an integrated assembly, right? Why GCC is making it difficult? Well, because... Uh, Actually, the, the, the aspect of the integrated assembler, as years pass after LLVM, more and more and more people, including a lot of Clang and LLVM hackers, they are coming to realize that the, an integrated assembler was not a, such a good idea, after all. I mean, there is a discussion which See, is where to put the abstractions here. Just, just, just an example. Uh, when I was like hacking on BPF early on, the first... Uh, BPF backend I wrote was for GCC. LVM was second. So when I wrote for GCC, I didn't use, well, I didn't invent an assembler. I just made GCC to emit binary. Because, well, G not having an integrated assembler in GCC, in my opinion, is kind of silly. Like, it makes life difficult. So I just made GCC well, backend to emit binary. It was easy and simple. OK, sure. I mean, I kind of started using exokernels, too. They are nice, and I mean, why? I mean. Right, yeah, but how is that related to this? Thing is, you, need, you, you have an assembly language, assembler syntax. It is unconventional. 
It is problematic, objectively problematic. It is ambiguous. You have syntactic ambiguities. There are things that you cannot do because of this. And now, my question is, well, ambiguity is we it really worth it? Ambiguity we have to fix. But if you point that R1, you cannot distinguish between R1 and foo, well, yeah, it's just like in C, you cannot distinguish it between int and foo. And, well, that's why there are keywords. Mm -hmm. Look, why is this so precious to you? Why, why, I mean, why do you have to have a totally, completely different syntax for your assembly language than the rest of the world? Why? Because users matter more than the developers pain. <laughs> okay, fine, cool. Okay, so I guess that the, the um, users matter most. Okay, well. Is the fine. views matter? Fine, the users could be using, you know, GCC for months now if it was not because of this. So, uh, those users don't matter? I mean, really? Anyway, uh, we, it's just we can discuss, but there are other points. Uh, so, I, I think given now there's a coffee break until 11, that we probably need to take this to the hallway, but then you also have other topics, right? So, oh, yeah. I think when, when we, once we come back, uh, after the break, we can continue with your other topics. Okay, sure. All right, thank you.